Ever wonder what it takes to live a life creatively? So do we. That's why we're here, to find out what clever people do to succeed in the arts, business, and education. I'm Cecily Korst, and this is The Trailer Talks. We're interviewing artists and educators, musicians, and thought leaders at home and on the road. So come on, it's going to be a good trip. Today, we're on location courtesy of My Beverly Hills Florist with David Danishgar, an entrepreneur and one of the creators of BloomNation.com, and we're talking about his creative life. David, I'm glad to see you. Thank you. Thanks. Glad to be here. Thanks for coming and visiting. So tell us about your journey thus far. Yeah, I had a pretty interesting journey. It all started back when I was an undergrad at Berkeley. I actually got a chance to teach a poker class at the University of Berkeley. So what did you study at, in school? Yeah, so at Berkeley I studied e economics. Okay. Um, so I had an econ background. They had something called a decal program. And at the time I was really fascinated by probability and statistics and Las Vegas. So I got an opportunity to actually teach a poker class, be a resident professor, and it was called the probability Probability and Statistics of Gaming. Berkeley is a super liberal school. Mm -hmm. I mean, probably the most liberal in the world, which I loved because it lets you think outside the box. Um, and it lets you use education in a way that may other, some other schools may not have. In mm -hmm. this case, math, statistics, but in poker, psychology was one of the most fascinating things. The ability to understand other people's mind. Why are they doing stu certain stuff? Why are they trying to elude certain things with their posture, with their breathing, with the way they're betting? And so poker really fascinated me. And there was a casino uh, near school and uh, we would go and we'd play and we'd test out these theories. In the beginning it was like an investment cost. We wouldn't necessarily win all the time. Mm -hmm. But the more we studied it and the more we understood what was going on, the more intriguing the game got. And from then I went to the corporate world uh, after I graduated Berkeley and I only lasted about six months. I really couldn't endure it. Um, and I decided uh, with my parents who are Persian, Jewish, quite conservative, hey, why don't I take a chance at playing something that I learned a lot about through college. I mean, obviously I went to my classes most mm -hmm. of the time. But, um, and they say, you know what, let him go ahead. I mean, what's, what's the worst that's gonna happen? He's gonna run out of money. In and that started my journey to uh, professional poker. I went on and started traveling the world playing poker. Self-taught, um, I don't think any person at 23 years old could ask for a more fascinating life. Traveling the world from Monaco to Barcelona, all around the US to Latin America, uh, ultimately to where I played the World Series of Poker and moved me to the direction now where we've become with two of my co-founders, budding entrepreneurs, and a new, latest, greatest idea. I love it. So you said you, you lasted in corporate America six months? Yeah, I mean, I got a job out of school at Countrywide, mm -hmm. which I guess everyone knows now didn't necessarily go as well. But yeah, I just didn't, there was some part of a hierarchy in terms of the corporate world, which just didn't fit with my character. Mm -hmm. uh, I think for myself, I want the latitude to be able to go wherever I want with something, and I probably run with a lot of uh, crazy ideas. And so, I mean, it was a great experience, but more importantly, sometimes uh, one of the most important things I found out is it's not like the positive things you take away. It's the things that you learn that you don't necessarily like that are just as valuable. And I learned that that path wasn't for me. You started out in college, you were gonna go and have a regular career. And then you landed in Vegas, yeah. and now you're doing this creative side of life with flowers. Yeah. So it's. I think that's the natural transition, right? The natural transition is from poker player to of course. budding florist, correct? That's what everybody does, okay. right? <laughs> but, um, but yeah, the path, and I'll take you to it was really interesting. So in 2008, I won the World Series of Poker. And towards the end of my poker career, there was something that was not necessarily fulfilling for me. Poker was an amazing game, like I told you, not just math, but psychology. Mm -hmm. And you met a lot of incredible people. But I wanted to do something bigger. I also wanted to use some of my higher learnings mm -hmm. to put it to kind of a, almost you can think of a more creative outlet. So uh, at the time, I decided to apply to business school mm -hmm. and say, well, let's see which crazy business school will take a budding professional poker player and bring them into their amazing institution. Uh, the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, which was one of the largest, probably actually right now, probably the top ranked business school in the world, said we'll take a chance on him. Mm -hmm. So it was that time that this idea came to fruition. Uh, my best friend, Fabio Sharaka had been coming up with this idea. Mm -hmm. And he came to me one day and said, listen, hey, I know you're going on the finance path, but I have a really good idea. His aunt was a local florist. Mm -hmm. And had been telling them how, A, they'd been working with these 
uh, what they call wire services. So 1-800-Flowers, uh, Teleflora, FTD, that most people don't know, but they're starting to learn with social media, great, great online shows like this, that they're not real florists. They're just marketing middlemen. Mm -hmm. So she was frustrated because she was not getting any income right. or profit on those orders. But on top of that, she, the customer didn't even know who she was because they just go to the site, buy, the florist would deliver. And what happened is he was seeing deteriorating quality. The florists were frustrated and mm -hmm. the customers were getting shitty products. So the common adage is, well, why don't you go direct to your local florist? But it doesn't seem like anyone does. It's difficult to find a great florist in New York or here at my Beverly Hills florist. You may be in Colorado looking to send flowers to Beverly Hills, and you don't know about David and his amazing, talented group. So Fabwood came to me this idea and said, hey, before you think about anything crazy, come sit down. Let's see what this idea can do. So we used the University of Chicago to talk to amazing mentors, great professors, investors, and try to get validation for the idea. And that's where we are now. Uh, I graduated this past summer, so it's almost been about 10 months, 9 mm -hmm. months, and the site's really grown a lot. It's almost like an Etsy for flowers, like these creative arts and crafts. Mm -hmm. I mean, it'd be awesome, but nobody knows about them. Right. Now we're bringing it to one of the biggest online industries uh, in the globe, which is flowers. So that's where I get my rush. I used to get it from poker, and now thinking that we can actually change the way people buy flowers online for the next 10 years is uh, pretty exhilarating. So it's more of an experience. What we're trying to do in the goal of Bloom Nation is to take the offline experience mm -hmm. of walking to a flower shop and bring it online anywhere. So those guys who don't know a lot about flowers and want to watch the football game, they can still buy from David sitting on a couch at their home. And ladies, they have no excuse. <laughs> for the local florist to actually be doing an amazing job and for people to you know, start spreading the word, that's, that's what's getting people to the site. And that's definitely taking a little bit of time and honestly a lot of work on our technical team to make an amazing website and the florist, but it's a partnership, mm -hmm. you know? And that's one of the things I didn't have at poker, right? Poker was a very individual game. I was playing for myself. I had clocked my time. I was winning this much money. I, I never had that team spirit. And now it's not just like a team uh, of our group at Bloom Nation. I mean, we're working now with thousands of local florists mm -hmm. and we're actually helping them uh, get customers and grow their business and do what they want to do and live this this amazing artistic lifestyle that I believe as the internet comes through without someone like us mm -hmm. a lot of these brick and mortar floors may even close. But what's the hardest thing that you've had to do so far? I really believe and I know this is very cliche but I really believe you have to do something you love. Mm -hmm. So for myself one of the things is I would say in that aspect I'm pretty stubborn and so finding something like if you look at it in the last two years in terms of work there's only two things I've loved was poker that I started a decade ago and entrepreneurship and doing something massive and amazing that changes the way people buy online. It's difficult to find those things. So for me, it's been a daunting task. And I've never been somebody who's like, okay, I can go into working at this agency for five years and taking you know, shit, so to speak, because it will bring me up in the bureaucracy of the world. I think if it's a really amazing idea and you have passion, you have to go for it right away. And so I found that. And I've found that before. It's almost like love. I don't want to equate it, but uh, to love something that you do is a daunting task. What's your advice to um, other people who are launching a creative business like yours? When I was in business school, mm -hmm. and I, was, I knew I wanted to go into entrepreneurship, every single professor told me to go to a poker-related startup. Right? It's, and I, I found this fascinating. Every time I came with an idea, and these are the, this is probably the number one business school in the world, they're telling me, well, that's great, but Go with where your passion comes from behind. But I think it's a creative passion. It doesn't necessarily mean that I have to go into a poker-based startup and create something like that. I think it's that determination and well, but more importantly, there's a drive and a passion that I never thought I'd get out of flowers. As, like, I don't know, based on my character, maybe you guys would think that, but I wasn't a big flower person two years ago. Mm -hmm. I wasn't the, uh, I mean, I should have been. And now we're changing, and I'm making everyone become a flower person. So. <laughs> but it wasn't in my in my blood, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm learning a lot of the flowers uh, right now. But what was in my blood is the excitement and the passion to do something with a group on our own, mm -hmm. be the leaders, and see what happens. And it didn't come out of poker. So that's one of the things I've really taken from this experience. You don't necessarily have to go to something that you are screamingly passionate about. You have to just find something that taps that same passion. And that's not even something I got from... Uh, that was amazing process. That's something that I learned as uh, this idea progressed. Cool. Thank you very much. Okay. I appreciate sounded it. Sounded good? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. That was a glimpse inside of David's life and journey. You can find out more about Bloom Nation on Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, and at his website, bloomnation.com. While your mouse is warmed up, visit our website at thetrailertalks.com.
I'm Cecily Korst. Join us for the next road trip. Can my house look like this? Because it's so pretty. Not a problem. You made the address and the credit card. I've learned so much. I actually go to their shops now and I can almost name every every flower.